Welcome to this uh, session on natural neutrality, how to identify discrimination and advanced solutions. Uh, my name is Luca Belli, I work at Ferris State University, and I'm the founder of the Dynamic Coalition on Natural Neutrality. Uh, today, we will co moderate this session together with uh, another group that works at the Bergman Center for Internet Society and is also the co founder of the Dynamic Coalition on Natural Neutrality. So, this uh, meeting is uh, uh, aimed to be a, a meeting of the dynamic coalition of national strategy. So uh, this is a, a group, an open and multi-stakeholder group that was established as a component of the United Nations Intergovernance Forum and that aims at uh, uh, analyzing uh, the natural neutrality debate and uh, provide some solutions and, uh, and uh, provide a platform to, uh, to envisage common initiatives. So, uh, today this panel uh, will be structured as a, uh, in the first part as an uh, interactive, hopefully, a discussion with my distinguished panelists. And then uh, it will be a fishbowl, so every uh, attendee can, can, can have the possibility to join the panel to uh, ask questions, to uh, contribute in steering the discussion. Uh, so, uh, what, why do we have we, have we felt that the need to uh, to uh, establish this dynamic coalition? Because the, the network fighting debate is a 15 years old debate. Uh, over the last 15 years, we uh, had several examples of how uh, internet traffic management can be discriminatory. Uh, the, the debate was started 15 uh, years ago by uh, professors uh, Lemley and Lessig with their seminal paper on uh, uh, the end and to end, where they, they were arguing that the, the tremendous uh, innovation that is allowed by the internet is, uh, depends essentially on the open nature of the internet protocols, the open software that implements this soft, uh, these protocols. And, uh, and also on the end-to-end -end principle that, that uh, decentralizes the intelligence of the network uh, into its edges. And the consequence of those principles is a non-discriminatory treatment that was later uh, defined natural neutrality. So knowing that this uh, natural neutrality principle uh, stems from uh, the technical core of the internet architecture, uh, I would like to start uh, uh, asking some questions to Alejandro Bizanti from the um, Autonomous University of Mexico and ICE of Mexico, who is uh, a very known representative of the technical community. So I would like to start by asking to Alejandro uh, what is uh, a non discriminatory or reasonable traffic management for the for a technical community? Uh, thank you, Luke. Can you hear me well? Thank you, Luca, and uh, cheers to all and to the panel. Thanks for putting this together uh, and for the work we've been doing on the Network Neutrality Dynamic Coalition, which is a very interesting form of organization emerging from the internet governance world. Uh, the Network Neutrality, I mean, to your question, uh, as with any interesting technical question, uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, depends very much what, what is network neutrality or what is reasonable, non-discriminatory things that you can do to traffic and still be respecting network neutrality. It depends very much on the conditions, uh, it depends very much on the network you are running and who you are running it for. So it's very different if you are running a local network at your home uh, or if you are running a public service, uh, which is, on the other hand, not necessarily the internet service is classified as a public service. So it doesn't have a kind of strong legal obligations of must carry or must offer or common carriage that a few countries have. Actually, they are not that common even. So it's, it's hard to see from the Anglo world, uh, which has this common carriage obligation that uh, many countries don't even think about. It. You're uh, the owner of the network and you're basically free to do with it uh, almost anything you want. Uh, now, to, to, to very specific practices, for example, uh, you have something uh, the, the most radical view of what network neutrality is, and therefore what forbids anything you would do, is what we call uh, in nice of Mexico, for example, the five alls, which would be the traffic, the, the traffic you carry have, must have allow for all ports, all protocols, all 
contents, all origins and all destinations. This is clearly not viable when you're operating a network. You have to be selective with some traffic. You may see a DDoS attack developing. You may see, uh, for example, port 25 blocking, which was in the questions you asked previous to the panel. Uh, that's a, a, a recommended practice, but it's open and transparent for everybody, and you will tell your users that you're going to be doing it. So one of the conditions then is you shouldn't be doing anything you cannot tell your users. That's a, that's, that's a reasonable definition there as well. Uh, we, you have elaborated an interesting uh, uh, framework to assess uh, internet traffic management practices according to the, uh, from a risk management perspective. In the, you have made a contribution in the report of the Dynamic Coalition uh, elucidating this framework. Can you tell us something about this, uh, this uh, risk management uh, model that you have elaborated and uh, on which the network entitled this definition is it based? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, what I did last year uh, during, uh, uh, after your invitation is um, I've been teaching for a while uh, on different issues related to the internet, and particularly internet security comes up very often. And uh, what I've told people is to stop thinking so absolutely about security and even stop using the word security uh, in, in, at work because it's a very absolute thing. What we do really have, and uh, what we can really uh, work on, is risk management. Because in risk management, you begin by identifying what the risk is, what the, the asset you own that this is at risk. You can quantify the risk, for example, how likely or probable it is and uh, what the impact or cost of the risk is. And then you have a certain series of disciplines which merge in different ways of looking at this. You can look at uh, detect, uh, identifying, detecting, preventing. Uh, once you have detected a, a risk that's materializing, responding in a planned way, you have contingency planning, you have business continuity planning, you have mitigation. All these are the risk management disciplines. So applied to network neutrality violations or to traffic management practices, uh, you have to be able, first of all, to detect whether something is going wrong. So you can use something as crude as a pretty good tool as net analyzer, or you may have to do something really sophisticated to find out whether an ISP is uh, filtering traffic selectively or throttling it, which is even harder to detect because it's only becoming slower, but it doesn't disappear. Um, and then you have to be able to respond. And the responses that we usually have are, first of all, look for an alternative, go through a, a, a VPN, which may slow you, but may keep open some ports or, 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 or sites, uh, and so forth. Or you may want to actually protest uh, as a consumer uh, to, the, to the ISP, or go for legislation, which in some countries is the, uh, seen as the only way to guarantee network neutrality. And to, to end to your question, the, this framework is not based on any specific network neutrality definition. It's uh, on traffic management practices. So it's up to you to decide when the violation, what to quantify the violation. No, it's minor, marginal, doesn't affect many users, or this is really radical and we have to go to full scale lobbying against the legislature. Thank you, Alejandro. So we will now focus on the importance of net neutrality and what is the impact that it has on innovation but in the commercial perspective and non-commercial perspective. So I will invite uh, Renata Villa from the World Foundation and I will ask you if you could present uh, why it's so important for you to maintain an uh, open and neutral internet and what are the risks of discriminatory traffic management practice on online innovation. Well, I uh, will introduce very, uh, this very basic idea that I have and I was discussing and you said we are at this very beginning of uh, new technology that the internet is such a new thing that uh, has uh, enabled citizens everywhere to do wonderful things and to create and innovate because of this open nature. And if we uh, allow, uh, we violate the principles of neutrality at this moment of uh, when we still do not know uh, the capacity and the potential that uh, that this new technology has is like uh, we were locking the primary colors, basically. If we were if we were not allowing anyone else to innovate further, so it's a, it's a very simple way to put it. It, it is uh, we cannot see still the misses and possibilities of developing uh, that we have ahead, and we cannot imagine still the future. And by locking it, uh, just because of business models of uh, people who are not creative enough. And who uh, see 
in a locked system, the only way that they can make money out of something, then we, we are really uh, locking the possibility of a future that we can we can still not even the possibility to imagine. So um, that's why I think that it's very important to keep the platforms open. And it's not only an issue about the market, and it's not about the issue of consumers, but in these years, in recent years, we have seen an evolution of passive consumers, consumers to creators. And by locking the net, we will stay at the consumer stage. And we will completely uh, neutralize, neutralize the empowerment, and not only economic empowerment, but the empowerment of all kinds that bring the possibility to create something with this network. So. And uh, could you say a few words about the Wagner campaign and uh, whether you can see some kind of um, intersection between this campaign and the issue of net neutrality? Well, basically, uh, uh, the neutral ne networks that do not discriminate uh, specific content or users is one of the principles of the Web We Want, which is a campaign, uh, a positive agenda campaign that we are promoting with a group of organizations with, uh, which was co founded and uh, heavily. Uh, promoted by one of the leading uh, organizations here in the U.S. Uh, leading the discussion of net neutrality, Free Press. Who's one of his members is here, you can ask him later. Uh, 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 and uh, all, the, all, the, all the members of uh, our advisory board and this coalition, international coalition of organizations, consider that so vital for the future of the internet that it is included as one of the main areas that we will really work on. And what we are trying to do is to see in places where we can promote a positive agenda, positive uh, laws, uh, to promote them. I mean, uh, and uh, to, uh, together with, a, with that connected network that can uh, help activists on the ground pushing for that. Um, it comes to my mind, um, um, the, ex the examples that we will talk later, I imagine, of, of uh, Chile and the Netherlands that are leading examples that we can copy and that we can export. And we can, uh, uh, this uh, vicious circle of exporting ballot loss from one country to country, we can kind of transform it and virtuous circle of uh, sharing experiences and exporting good laws that will keep our internet open. Thank you, Renata. So I will invite now Jana Valida from the Wikimedia Foundation uh, to give us an overview of the Wikipedia Zero Initiative, uh, which is an initiative to provide free mobile access to Wikipedia in developing countries. And um, I will ask you if you could uh, um, explain how do you think that this initiative is likely to be affected by a of neutrality regulation, and also if you could say more generally how do you think that uh, uh, discriminatory traffic management practice could have an impact on non-commercial activities? So I'm, I'm going to talk to you second point first, um, just just because that's that's the one that we're all talking about. And I feel like um, the effect of the lack of uh, neutrality is sort of really, really important for preserving an open internet for non-commercial activities and for free speech. And we don't hear as much about that aspect of it as we do about the interrelation between um, innovation and net neutrality. I mean, I think part of that is that non-commercial activities online um, appear to be becoming marginalized, but really um, the internet is not was not designed to be a commercial platform. And so there's a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of business models that have developed over time that are sort of commercial in nature, but there's also really important non-commercial activities that we that we want to preserve and we want to make sure that it's a platform where they can evolve um, further. So uh, in addition to Wikipedia, of course, um, there's uh, projects like uh, Project Gutenberg uh, or uh, the Internet Archive that are sort of non-commercial projects, but also um, if we think about it, there's a lot of uh, non-profit advocacy groups that are represented here today um, that rely on an open network to communicate with their audiences. Um, in, um, and also, of course, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're, we're demonstrating as we speak. Uh, so, um, but but also, uh, so it's so it's incredibly important that we're not cre that. Uh, 
we make sure that the internet does not become a tiered network where uh, commercial players are able to pay their, for um, accessing their um, users um, and getting speed access to their users and uh, non-commercial network uh, platform content providers are being deprioritized. So that's sort of what the, the impact on, on uh, commercial activities from the lack of a, uh, a commercial, uh, a uh, strong net neutrality principle. Um, on the flip side, though, uh, we also need to make sure that although we really do need to have a strong net neutrality principle, it needs to be a clearly articulated principle so that it doesn't impact um, non-commercial projects that are being developed or will develop going forward um, in a negative way. So um, one, uh, one thing that uh, I think the definition of net neutrality should focus on is the idea that uh, the core goal of net neutrality, which is to avoid blocking and avoid uh, creating a two-tiered uh, internet, um, and focus on the non-discriminatory transmission of data, um, and so that it doesn't necessarily encompass um, access to the internet or discriminatory, especially discriminatory payment for access to the internet. And the reason is that there's a lot of non-commercial projects, there's some non-commercial projects, that um, are developing where uh, um, they're trying to get users to access particular sites um, to uh, um, for free because it's important. It provides important access to information. So some some projects that uh, that we've seen so far are uh, Refugees United, which is a mobile app that provides access to um, refugees uh, so that they can uh, find. Uh, family members online. Another one is uh, the Smart Health um, app, uh, which educates Android users in Africa about uh, uh, various diseases. Um, and the third project that I was going to mention is, of course, the project that I'm working on, which is Wikipedia Zero, that uh, uh, gets um, carriers in developing countries um, to commit to uh, providing free access, free data, when uh, uh, people in developing countries access uh, Wikipedia on their mobile phones. Um, and the project essentially doesn't really um, impact any of the policy behind net neutrality, but it could be uh, you know, prevented with a definition of net neutrality that covers not only non-discrimination over the transmission of the network, but also at the very end uh, of the network. So uh, the, the way it doesn't implicate the policies is because essentially it doesn't um, um, speed up the, the access to Wikipedia, it doesn't uh, deprioritize access to other sites, um, it, it doesn't include any deep packet inspection, right? Um, it's, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not needed to figure out how to treat the content. Um, it doesn't include um, any payments, like the Wikimedia Foundation doesn't pay uh, uh, carriers to um, to zero rate access to their users, and we don't enter into any kind of exclusive deals. So, in, in other words, it's it's really the non-commercial nature of Wikipedia is reflected in the Wikipedia Zero project. And uh, although this is just like a handful of projects that are currently developing, I hope that we will be seeing lots more um, access to knowledge <coughs> projects in the future. And therefore, it's important to have a really clear definition of net neutrality that, uh, that really protects non-commercial activities and speech but doesn't go as far as prohibiting um, non-commercial activities that were not intended to be uh, regulated out by net neutrality. Excellent. So uh, we have seen that the uh, net neutrality principle is uh, extremely useful to promote innovation, to allow uh, non-commercial activities to flourish uh, on the internet, creativity. But uh, an aspect that has been considered by the Dynamic Coalition on Net Neutrality is also the relation between uh, the net neutrality principle and the protection of human rights. We have dedicated the report of the Dynamic Coalition uh, that was presented at the IBF uh, some months ago to the relations between net, the net neutrality protection and the human rights protection. Uh, we have a, a elaborated a model framework on natural neutrality on the, on the uh, following the, 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 the stimulus of the Council of Europe, because this uh, model framework has been elaborated by the Dynamic Coalition through a multi-stakeholder, open, transparent process that was essentially done uh, with interactions uh, online. And then this, this model framework has been delivered to the Council of Europe, 
uh, and uh, I would like to know if Elvana can hear us so that she can explain us uh, what is the uh, in which activities is the Council of Europe uh, engaging and uh, what are the plans of the Council of Europe uh, to, to, to utilize this model that has been delivered uh, to, for these uh, further initiatives. Can you hear us, Elvana? Yes, I can. Excellent. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Luca, and hello to everyone. I see all the panelists. I know most of them. Hello. Um, but I don't see the people in the audience. And um, Hi. I would like to say two words to the people in the audience about the organization that I represent, the Council of Europe. You are, um, you are the sure. channel. Excuse me? Yeah, um, so, <laughs> oh, hi, yeah, um, so Council of Europe is a top organization which brings together 47 European states. Um, it's not the EU, which has 27 member states, it's, it's a larger organization. Um, the mandate of the Council of Europe is on issues of human rights, democracy, and rule of law. And we work with the governments of all the 47 member states to promote those, um, those values, primarily in three types of activities, um, standard setting, developing conventions, and um, other non-bank instruments, international law instruments, monitoring the performance of member states on those instruments, and provide technical assistance to member states. Um, as relates to the internet, you may know that we have um, a number of conventions, um, the Cybercrime Convention, the Data Protection Convention, convention um, we have the Antarota Convention, um, which protects children from sexual abuse and sexual exploitation on the internet as well, and the Medicrime Convention. Um, as regards non-binding standards, um, we have um, no, we have uh, standards on the governance of the internet, um, on the issue of governance of the internet. For example, we have some principles on, on the governance on the internet, and I'll stop at one of those. Um, we have also provided guidance to our member states on issues of freedom of expression, such as in respect of internet blocking, search engines, social networks, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, going back now to the net neutrality um, uh, topic, which is uh, your theme um, of discussion. Um, there we have a political support uh, by the 47 member states of the Council of Europe to the principle of network neutrality. And this is um, manifested in two, in two documents. One is in the set of governance principles, internet governance principles, which I mentioned. There is a specific principle there on uh, which is called open network and it's it's support for network neutrality basically um, saying that having management should respect uh, freedom of expression and human rights online and secondly uh, there is another political statement the declaration of network neutrality which is really focused on on, on the issue of network neutrality and looks at this principle from the perspective of freedom of expression and access to information. And it actually defines the principle with the words of uh, uh, having, have, having in mind freedom of expression as the ability of individuals to choose um, and to have access to content and services and applications that they choose to, 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 to have access to. Um, the, this statement says that traffic management uh, is not an interference per se, a priori, an interference with freedom of expression, um, but it can, it, can, it can actually amount to, to such an interference in certain cases, especially um, when it's not proportionate um, and when the principle of transparency is not respected. Um, so this is where we are at the moment um, in terms of political support for the principle. Um, there is also 
an ongoing initiative to look how to reinforce that 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 uh, that, uh, that stands that standing on, on network neutrality. Um, we will have a committee of experts which um, will look at how to um, provide a to, to reinforce the principle of, of network neutrality. We will see uh, what the discussion and what the um, appetite um, of, of, of the committee of experts will be and then of our member states on that. But we clearly have a mandate to continue working on, on, uh, on the issue of network neutrality and I'm looking forward to your discussions there to see um, what can I bring back to, 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 the, to the considerations for the discussions that are taking place in the Council of Europe. Um, now, as regards Europe, uh, another development which I think is worth mentioning, and perhaps some other panelists, perhaps Joe would like to say some words about it, is the um, consideration by the European Parliament um, of um, network neutrality uh, provisions as part of its um, of a proposal for regulation by the European Commission on the single uh, telecoms um, uh, market. Um, that is a development which is worth bearing in mind and, um, and, and looking at um, when we discuss uh, what's the best way to actually to um, develop policy on network neutrality. So I'll leave it at that, um, Luca, and um, so happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, and mainly thanks for uh, participating remotely. Uh, from France, where it's now one o'clock in the during the night, so we are very brave, thanks a lot. And uh, by the way, if you are interested in uh, reading the paper in which the, this model framework uh, uh, has been uh, uh, described, and, and this paper is an official document of the CDMSI, the committee for the steering committee on media and information society of the Council of Europe, there are some copies there. You can find it uh, on the Council of Europe website and also on the website of the NARI coalition. So now we can keep on with Okay, our so we will now look at how those principles have been or might be implemented in, um, at the national level in different jurisdictions. So, Francisco, uh, could you please tell us about the network neutrality regulation that has been enacted in Chile, uh, which is in fact the first country to have um, implemented the principle of network neutrality in Chile? And so, if you could uh, tell us about this and also share with us what are the positive or the negative lessons that uh, can be learned from this. Well, uh, hello everybody. As you know, I'm saying, uh, Chile was the first country that passed, uh, passed an under neutrality law back in 2009. If I recall well, let me check. Uh, oh, you have to take it back on. But no, 2004. Uh, and as uh, Alejandro was saying, most internet services in countries uh, remain like unregulated from a telecommunications law perspective. So, which is good because there's lots of applications or issues that if the internet was being regulated like at the very beginning, we would have like you now measuring every kilobyte in our traffic, for instance, that happened at some time when internet services were provided or maybe there were only like uh, some providing services that were approved or any other uh, restrictions that have, uh, would have impeded the internet the expansion and development as we know now. So, but there are some issues that need to be regulated uh, and in the case of Chile, they decided to modify the telecommunications law. So, they implemented only three articles in their telecommunications law to uh, install some obligations to internet service providers in regards to their uh, internet uh, provision activities. In fact, it's not to internet service providers, it's to public service uh, concessionaries that provide internet access to their users. So they have like uh, uh, some obligations and can be classified into two big groups. First, there are transparency obligations on disclose the aggregation rates, the speed of the plans they offer, and also to disclose what traffic management uh, measures are the uh, providers taking. And on the other side, is to limit these uh, traffic management practices to only uh, the ones that falls into the uh, category of non-arbitrary discrimination uh, activities. So, uh, internet service providers, for instance, can uh, block some ports because of um, suspicious activity. They can do some traffic management, but first they have to disclose these management activities. 
And second, they need to, uh, to these activities cannot be arbitrary. And this is where the problem begins. Because, uh, yeah, internet neutrality is regulated, but instead we have now this new uh, standard of non-arbitrary uh, discrimination. So what non-arbitrary discrimination is, and our telecommunications authority haven't sorted out yet. So when enforcing our net neutrality law, what has happened is that uh, the transparency obligations are being actively enforced. So if some ISP is publicizing a speed that is turns out to not be the speed that they are offering, or the aggregation rate, or the some measures turns out not to be the ones that they are disclosing, this can turn into fines or some other enforcing activities from the telecommunications authority. But when it comes to traffic management like in, in the day to day, uh, there's no certainty of what arbitrary discrimination is. So, for instance, uh, one provider in their neutrality information, they say that they distinguish in between uh, sensible and non-sensible protocols. So, sensible protocols would be like HTTP, uh, video on demand, or voice over IP, because it requires like a, a time frame to be done. Like if I'm watching a stream movie, I need to uh, see it now. But peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, file transfer protocols are being like affected by these uh, management practices. So some ISP in Chile can like inform that they do traffic management between 4 p.m. and 2 a.m. and they discriminate between between these two kind of traffic, and uh, they end up uh, sorry, and uh, the telecommunications authority is not enforcing those sort of traffic management because they feel or they think that it's within the transparency obligations and there's no uh, arbitrary discrimination in such measures. So it's a part of the problem that we are having enforcing the law, but also uh, about what the law objectives were. Sometimes uh, we discuss here in the name of principles or like what we think is correct, but when implementing policy countries, can pursue different objectives. In the case of Chile, uh, this started with some uh, anti-trust cases that determined that other companies could offer services over the uh, internet services that the telecommunications <coughs> providers uh, were offering. So the main point in Chile was to authorize the use of any device over the internet. So the neutrality law had this uh, print on it besides talking about principles or freedom of expression or other fundamental rights. So we need to deal with what policy situation originated the law, and we need to work with that. So let's keep so. Thank you very much. Uh, Carolina, could you talk about the experience of
uh, I was doing CTS when that started many years ago. Uh, uh, the Anapel took a, a strong step last year, and not a lot of people paid attention to that, right? Uh, uh, reforming uh, the, the norm four, which we call that was the norm that regulated the internet for the first time in Brazil many years ago, and reforming what they define as internet, and that redefinition of the concept of internet through that regulation put Anatel as um, one of the regulators also of the internet, which before they were not, they were just regulating telcos. And a lot of people did not pay attention because we still as advocates who are very hopeful, and that hope is getting smaller and smaller every day uh, about democracy view. So talking a little bit about democracy view, uh, it has been a really difficult fight over the years because of the very delicate compromises that had to be done and civil society was always in a debate if we would keep endorsing or not our civil at the moment, we are not sure <laughs> anymore actually, we just the changes in December. And one of the big changes introduced in December was a new principle in the Marco Civil, in the set of principles, which is Article 3, uh, uh, on exactly net neutrality, right? Which impacts directly net neutrality. So while we have Article 9, assuming we're gonna have isonomy and net neutrality for packages and, and services and data, uh, we do have two exceptions. One exception is related to uh, technical aspects in, uh, 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 that are necessary for the adequate uh, uh, provision of those services and also for emergency services. So we already have those exceptions. And then later, uh, in December, they inserted the principle that uh, the freedom of new business models on the internet, uh, as soon as they do not conflict with the other principles, and that neutrality is already in, is also in Article 3. Uh, whoever, when I see that, I have the English version of Marcus, so I can share with you later. Um, so by bringing that, you put two, two things that can be contradictory business, uh, different diverse type of business models which you can understand in very different ways, including how you manage uh, 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 providing our services and uh, 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 neutrality. So that's the situation, that was the compromise that uh, Molon, who is the rapporteur of Marcus Review, has justified as the necessary compromise to have the telcos on the side and should move the Marcus view forward. Uh, today we just got some news that the, the lead of the opposing party will uh, vote against Marcus view. Uh, so it's going to be really bad. Yeah, it's going to be really worse for Brazil in a moment that we're going to host the net in now. So it's going to be kind of uh, interesting to see that. Uh, but that's the stage we are. But in regard to Latin America in general, what is emerging is a matrix of a set of very different exceptions to the net neutrality rule. And I think that does pose a challenge to both companies and advocacy on how we deal with those exceptions and how the telcos agencies actually implement them concretely. So maybe it's the time for all of us to go a step further and maybe bring the engineers with us to say, okay, how we actually implement in a way that they are uh, supporting of the principles. So we have seen that network network driving principle, this non-discrimination principle, is instrumental not, from, not only to uh, promote uh, innovation but also to to, uh, to to foster the, the full enjoyment of, of end users' uh, fundamental rights. And this is one of the reasons why, since, the, since 2009 in Europe, the Commission has declared its uh, in commitment to the network neutrality principle. But uh, bizarrely. Uh, a proposal for a uh, uh, natural neutrality provision has been tabled just uh, some months ago. So I would like to ask to Joe Metami from Edric to provide us an overview of the current state of play of the uh, natural neutrality debate uh, at the European Union level. Joe, please. Thank you. Um, I'll start with two um, principles that um, are useful to understanding what's going on in Europe because it's not very easy. Uh, one of them is a quotation from Otto van Bismarck, who said that anybody who loves laws or sausages should never see either being made. Um, <laughs> the second is uh, an adaptation of Godwin's law that the longer an uh, internet discussion goes on, 
the more likely it is somebody is going to be compared with Hitler. I would <laughs> add the McNamee corollary, which says that the longer a net neutrality discussion goes on, uh, the more likely it is that some idiot politician is going to start talking about communism. It will become clear. So, the European Commissioner uh, took office uh, nearly five years ago, and she loves net neutrality. She said it again and again and again, and she promised legislation again and again and again. And then somehow, somehow the love ended. Somehow things weren't the way they used to be. Somehow they didn't look into each other's eyes the way they used to. And the love was no more. And so the commissioner decided that she wanted to propose a law that didn't enshrine net neutrality while using lots of words saying that she did like net neutrality. So the European Commission produced a vast overarching proposal that covers uh, mobile phone roaming, um, enforcement, net neutrality, and some other things. And this text is um, atrociously badly written, misleading, duplicitous, um, and a kind of text that you wouldn't want to give to a parliament uh, if the parliament was going to spend much time looking at it. So this text was finished in uh, May of last year, and there are elections in May of this year. So the European Commission thought, you know what, if we give the text to the European Parliament with a whole year to look at it, they're going to notice that it is not very good. So let's delay a little while. So then they launched it in September of last year, giving the Parliament much less time to work on it. But the proposal also includes a provision to bring an end to mobile phone roaming charges, which are quite high in Europe because well, there are lots of small countries all over Europe, so we incur mobile phone charges more easily. Um, so, the parliamentarians have a chance to do something popular just before the election, namely adopt a proposal um, <coughs> which includes getting rid of mobile roaming. And at the same time, there's this text which says something about net neutrality that nobody quite, under quite understands. So. Well, we don't have much time, let's push it through. Um, there are two ma major blocs in the European Parliament, Socialists and Conservatives, with the Liberals sitting in between. And uh, the uh, leader of the discussions for the Liberals uh, posted uh, a note on Facebook a few days ago saying that anybody that wants to regulate to keep uh, open internet um, is enforcing communism because you don't want to keep markets open because that's terrible for something or other. And uh, there we have it. We have a parliament about to adopt a text which it doesn't understand, which goes against the interests of European citizens, of European uh, innovators. Um, but at least we're avoiding communism, and after all, isn't that the most important thing? So I'll, I'll stop now and I'll let Regan explain that. Excellent. So uh, now I would like to ask you to Regan McDonald from Access to elaborate a little bit more on the details of these network neutrality provisions and the, the peculiar fashion in which they have been uh, rephrased, uh, uh, adding some, some wording on uh, the prohibition of discrimination within the limits of any contractually agreed data volume or speed. Thank you. Um, so as Joe mentioned, we have been um, dealing with this, this regulation and it has been actually quite a challenge to make sense of it because of the way it has been drafted. And while net neutrality, when you do get into um, writing it down, committing it into a piece of legislation, it does get technical. Uh, and this has been causing problems, especially if you consider the fact that members of the European Parliament are not exactly uh, technicians. Um, and then if you add in the other factors uh, that Joe already mentioned with the timing and the elections, um, you see what kind of mess we've been, we've been dealing with in, in Brussels. Um, and so I'll come to your point in a, in a second, Luca, because I do want to talk about some of the, the <coughs> finer problematic issues of, of this proposal. Um, but I think it's worth actually just reiterating um, 
what net neutrality is. Um, because we have seen in, since 2009 in, in the EU um, and now in the US that this term has very different and creative interpretations uh, depending on who's using this term. Uh, and from a campaigning uh, perspective to inform citizens on you know, the importance of net neutrality um, uh, is very difficult because it's hard to know what it actually means. So basically, it comes down to three basic principles, which are the guiding principles of the open internet. And the first one is the end-to-end -end principle. And that just means that all endpoints on the network should connect to all other endpoints on the network. Uh, the second is the best effort principle, which means that ISPs should do their best effort to deliver data um, as expeditiously as possible to these endpoints on the network. Um, and then the third element is the innovation without permission principle, um, which is one of the most exciting aspects of the internet, which means that anyone, anywhere can innovate without asking the permission of anyone or any entity. And this is really where the human rights dimension comes in to net neutrality, because it's not only about innovating in a, in a commercial sense, um, but also from a freedom of expression perspective, um, it includes you know, receiving information, but also imparting information. Um, and these are the three key principles. Um, so in this regulation, which is vast, um, it does look like a net neutrality law in some form. Um, there is a particular provision that does block, or, or that does prohibit um, explicit blocking and, and throttling of applications. Um, and we know from studies conducted uh, from consumers, uh, or the, 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 the um, uh, from BEREC, the, the regulators, uh, electronic regulators in um, the EU, uh, that about one quarter of citizens uh, in the EU are subject to these very blunt uh, and, and invisible forms of, of restrictions. The problem is that this proposal, while it does include a prohibition on this type of blocking and throttling, it opens the door to new types of discrimination that are much more nuanced. Uh, and this is one of the elements that has been brought up already by some panelists, and this is preferential treatment of content and services. Um, and this is one of the, the elements, and in the proposal it's called specialized services. Uh, and so can you tell us something more about uh, how specialized services have uh, been treated by the, the proposal? Well, the definition is extremely broad. Um, technically, there, there is such thing as specialized services, uh, and this could be an extra service with an enhanced quality uh, that you purchase on top of your internet access. So, for instance, IPTV could be a service that you could buy in addition to your access service. What the regulation fails to do is to define it properly. So right now, and what's even in a lot of reforms, uh, a lot of the definitions in the parliament, um, it is so broadly defined that it could mean any online service. Um, and this is really where you would destroy the best effort principle, but also this innovation without permission principle. Um, because what happens is uh, the telcos would have would get essentially to pick the winners and losers uh, and decide which kinds of services get wrapped up into your uh, internet access. Um, from an innovation and competition perspective, this is a death sentence uh, for, for innovation in, in Europe because you would never have new and innovative services that would be able to break into the market. What you would have instead is telcos which already have quite a bit of control in the individual member states um, picking and choosing the biggest and most popular services. That is normally US services, so you have uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google, and, and these which people like to use. Um, but if you put them into this, this internet um, access service and advertise them as access services, um, then you lock people into these, these services, and this is really um, Problematic. So, thanks, thanks a lot for highlighting that the freedom of expression dimension of the net neutrality debate is intimately intertwined with the freedom of innovation. So, expressing one's creativity means also innovate, produce new innovation uh, in part, and receive information is also in part and receive innovation. So, now I would like to ask from in the, in the audience, someone wants to 
join uh, our uh, panel rotating in and out. So if there if there is any uh, any volunteer to participate into this fishbowl. Please present yourself for uh, speaking. Thanks. Hi, my name is Andres Capurbo. I'm from Venezuela. I just wanted to comment on, on the recent extreme cases of net neutrality violations in my country. Uh, this, this, this is a re recent move, so it's not, it's not the situation in that, like in countries where the internet has always been under serious censorship. This is, these are recent moves, sometimes mandated censorship by regulators or other government agencies. Sometimes it seems to be private censorship in order to congratulate themselves with the government from the, from the side of the ISPs or, or other telco providers. And at the same time, allegations of service degradation on purpose nationwide, while at the same time throttling certain apps. This in a country where there already is no internet access and unreliable connections casts uh, limitations on freedom of information and expression. For example, uh, streaming video from professional sources like TV, TV stations, TV networks from locals or from abroad, or from amateurs perhaps recording what's happening in a protest or a conference, for example, I mean, having people send in that video and then downloading it is, is, is almost, doesn't almost make sense at all. I mean, it's, 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 it's a real problem because of the lack of connection speeds and the reliable connection to themselves. And now you have to that, uh, throttling certain apps, it, it's become, it becomes a, a really complicated panorama, especially since when, for example, in Venezuela, they recently blocked for almost two days images on Twitter. They block this the, 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 the server that serves all the images and interface parts for Twitter. That obviously was very viral, became viral, became easy to see, somewhat something easy to prove. I mean, technically, you could you could easily ping the server, you could trace route to the server, and define where exactly the, the trace route end. And actually, Twitter confirmed this this happening. But if you throttle apps then it becomes harder to realize what's going on. And you could throttle apps to the point that become, become they, don't, they just don't work. You could, you could make the connection so slow that you just can't send images, or you can send video. So, and that's really hard to prove. So, I don't know what other opinions this, this panel have on these particular issues. Do you have any reactions from Joe? Um, just to, to point out the, the censorship angle. Um, bizarrely, in the, the European proposal, there is a provision that included intra reasonable traffic management um, to um, enforce a court order or to prevent or impede serious crime. And which is contrary to the ICCPR, it's contrary to the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, and contrary to the European Convention on Human Rights, um, and then you end up in a situation where ISPs will be able to ingratiate themselves um, as exactly as you said, which then quid pro quo will lead to more opportunities for them to abuse their network for um, anti-competitive reasons and then the, the circle continues. So that's a, a very important point, unfortunately. Uh, very quickly, you pointed out something very important in the Latin American context, it's, 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 it's especially uh, for small countries, uh, we have a, a teleco, teleco monopolies, big corporations who are like have very close uh, love relationship, we can describe it as such, with the governments, with the parliaments. They can buy laws, basically. And so that makes it really hard to pass a net neutrality law in many countries in Latin America because the monopolies, which are regional monopolies, Love the possibilities to do so, and mostly uh, U.S. or European monopolies interfering in the in the policy making. And a very concrete example, very similar to the situation right now in Venezuela, it happened during the Honduras coup. And uh, it, it, it will it is so ironic that because uh, it's, it's 
regional monopoly and it, it is uh, cheaper to, uh, to use the same equipment and the same platforms and to serve Guatemala and Honduras. There was a collateral effect that the WordPress was blocked in Honduras and was blocked partially in places in Guatemala where, where uh, the infrastructure was, was shared. Another point is that many countries, small countries, lack uh, uh, anti-trust law. So it is like really internet users in developing countries which are mostly disconnected right now, and to totally defenseless. So in, in Europe, it's super important for innovation. In uh, Latin America, in many countries where the connectivity is so slow, uh, so slow and the connected are so uh, only the middle class and the privileged, it is a, a, an issue of in social inclusion because uh, the poor are accessing uh, the consumer wealth, not the creative wealth. And I think that it's important to point out close relationship and closing the possibility of progress. Francisco, and then uh, a comment from the internet order. And then... uh, I think that when a country has a strong human rights framework in place, you wouldn't need a neutrality law to impede censorship. It's because there's like a bigger fundamental right at stake, like freedom of expression. But uh, even with that, the neutrality laws are, uh, laws are really useful to have extra enforcement systems for the private sector to avoid content blocking. But it's not the only thing to rely on. And when you have like institutional weaknesses, as is my opinion, it's happening in Venezuela, even a neutrality law maybe wouldn't help in that case. So it's like thinking that instating a uh, data protection law would protect us from the NSA spying, and the neutrality law would protect us with a country that is, has like a bigger weaknesses on their institutional frameworks. Hi, I'm Tim Carroll with Press. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I think that um, earlier, the panel that, was, that went before the Verizon uh, policy uh, specialist said that, uh, and I quoted him, I quoted him, he said, net neutrality is a beautiful terminology, but it doesn't really apply to the internet as we know it. Um, and I th it's important to, for us, those of us who actually think it's more than beautiful terminology, to actually define it. And um, I applaud that effort because what will happen if you don't define it is that you'll get people like the policy um, VP from Verizon trying to change that definition and constantly changing the definition to a point where it confuses the issue and they can get away with doing things that are clear violations of net neutrality. And I think your experience in the EU Parliament was very similar where you had someone say, oh, I'm for net neutrality, but when you get down to the, the process of actually writing it into law, everybody sorts of back away. So we, we need this, the, these three principles are important. We need to have that sort of common definition so that we can't allow these people, whether they're from industry or government, to start to weasel away from it. So I just want to uh, reply saying that the, in, the, in the model law we have elaborated, we have precisely defined uh, net neutrality, and it has been a definition quoting that it has been the, the, the fruit of a, of a collaborative of effort. So it's not just a definition for lawyers or for tacky, but it's a, a multi stakeholder definition. Sorry for using the term multi <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very briefly, what you have in Venezuela, if things are like, like uh, we have been described by Andres and we understand some of them are that way, uh, you just have censorship. You don't have to go into this baroque pilgrim of uh, you know net neutrality after principles. You have censorship and filtering and blocking. Uh, so, so reactions should not be distracted, in my opinion. Uh, nor do I think that, uh, and Francisco already leads to it, uh, that a law on network neutrality is the best thing to have. In many cases, I think it would actually be a, a loss. If you have, if, depending on the country, if you have consumer rights, if you have uh, competition law and so forth, many of them are better principles. Uh, the way they are articulated and the way the contracts are written, because you are always speaking about something that you get from a private uh, service. So in many places, it will be consumer law, competition law that are actually a better tool to keep network neutrality enforced. And uh, I think one proof has been given by Carolina Rossini here. Uh, when you mentioned uh, the third provision now introduced into the law, uh, which is innovative business models uh, as, a, as, as an exception for network neutrality, 
That is exactly the language that EDMO, the European Telecommunication Network Operators uh, Organization, is using in Europe to undermine the network neutrality. That's it. So, but that tells you that, you know, uh, as, uh, as uh, was it, Francisco Boyce said about PISMA, uh, that, that's actually the reason why many of us in Latin America are very wary that the Marco Civil legislation was actually put to Congress. Because you know what goes into sausages, but you know in what state it emerges. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I also, I would like to, uh, I think there is a comment there, uh, Madam, no, do you want to do it? Uh, hi, my name is Pilar, I'm from Colombia, and I don't know if it's because we are part of the same um, global system in America Latina, but we have also in Colombia part with net neutrality. And in our case, it's similar to the, the point that said uh, Renata uh, point of view, that some of the problem is about the monopolies. Uh, in my country, in this moment, the regulation of net neutrality uh, accepts the idea of segmented, the market segmentation. And for us, it's a huge problem because uh, when you go to pay as a service for mobile, you can accept only a plan who includes only chat or mail and social network. And they sell that as internet. And of course, that's, that's an internet. So when we accept that idea of market segmentation, we accept that Internet is something different than the real internet is. And we don't can say anything because there is not a, a regulatory mark and, and there is no way to try to push a real definition because there is not a real definition of net neutrality. So I think that that's part of the problem, and it's a problem with the local telcos who has a lot of power, and it's a problem with the local NGOs that we don't have enough power to say that in the, uh, in the, in the, at the local level, so I don't know. Thanks a lot. So I uh, would like to ask for some closing remarks from the panelists, because we are uh, running out of time, and I would like to start from Joe, that is eager on uh, providing us. Um, I just wanted to comment on the monopoly uh, issue because there are two monopolies, uh, possible monopolies at the same time. Going back to Ethno, Ethno during Wicket talked about ascending party pays model. That means that though the world pays for access to my customers. My customers are my monopoly. If I've got 20% of the market in the country, only 20%, you can't get access to them unless you go through me. So the idea is, um, is the creation of artificial monopolies. Even if there are five uh, services in the market, if you have net neutrality, if you don't have net neutrality, you have to pay to get in. And the outside looking in issue is the one that competition can't solve. The end user can choose ISP number one, ISP number two, or ISP number three, but if an ISP that controls 20% of the market says, you didn't pay, you don't get in. You don't even have a relationship with that ISP. You've got no leverage. You either pay, as um, Netflix will tell you, you either pay up or you, you go away. There's no competition, there's no choice. Um, just one comment. Uh... Also in Europe, uh, to Renata's comment about this love relationship between telcos and, uh, and, and governments, that also exists in the EU. And I hope that um, this approach of calling net neutrality something that it is not um, doesn't actually spread to, to other parts of the world. Um, and on this proposal, there is a possibility to actually fix it. Um, there is some decent uh, aspects in there, having you know proper definitions, 
of the specialized services that would that would prevent this tiering problem. Um, having you know a clear regulation that prohibits uh, anti-competitive practices is also very good. Um, limits on reasonable traffic management, transparency around practices. Um, this could be done. Uh, so we will find out in the next few months uh, what path the EU will take. Uh, what 28 countries will essentially decide whether or not they will go for not neutrality. Uh, or net neutrality, and we have a, an ongoing campaign, and it's called SaveTheInternet.eu, where you can go and um, call, email, even fax your member or a member of the European Parliament uh, to let them know just how important uh, this is. And we also have some of our our papers around, uh, which describe in greater detail uh, the finer points and the finer problems of of the regulation and and, and what you can do to to help. I think what I um, what we've heard a lot is the sort of the definitional problem. I think that where we are at right now is when we're beginning to see a lot of net neutrality laws being developed, and so it's really important at this point to kind of reach out and figure out exactly what are we talking about, what are we trying to regulate, how how do we <coughs> get there, um, and um, in sort of thinking ahead um, and making sure that we're we're regulating the, the precise uh, problem and not regulating away solutions, right? Not regulating away uh, free speech and, uh, and um, uh, innovation. So I just want to emphasize that. Sorry, there's also a closing remark from one of our... Uh, yes, thank you so much. ...rotating panelists. <laughs> My closing remark. Thanks, everybody. Um, I just, my name is Josh, I'm also from Free Press. Um, I just want to mention that net neutrality exists in the United States too as an issue, and uh, I'm sorry that we weren't able to, to talk about that today, although this was really illuminating and educational. Um, SaveTheInternet.com is also, I was just, I was struck <laughs> by the .eu. Um, that's an awesome site. There's another awesome site that you should check out, which is SaveTheInternet.com, which is about US focused net neutrality issues, which is uh, a bit on fire at the moment. Um, also, just kind of address the Wikimedia thing because I feel like there's this implication that somehow net neutrality would harm non-commercial speech, and I just want to say that from my perspective, I think a lot of people's perspective, that's absolutely not true, and in fact, it empowers non-commercial speech more than anything. And the issue that you're talking about, which is making deals with carriers to provide websites free of charge to consumers or you know free of data charges. Is another related issue, and in, in, in a lot of people's opinion, very problematic, non-commercial or not, because it creates um, a very, very narrow version of the internet, which is not actually the internet at all. It's a, it's a portal into certain sites that make deals with monetary or not with the ISPs. And so, I just want to say that I love Wikipedia, but I think it's a mistake to make that kind of deal with, with the carriers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Double close group. Right. <laughs> Um, um, yes, well, I think um, it's, it, it, I, so we'll have to agree to disagree on that, but I, it, it generally I don't think that it creates a narrow internet because uh, it, it, if, if specifically defined, it wouldn't be something where it can interfere with uh, an open internet, right? It's, it's it, you, you know, you're going to be respecting the end-to-end -end principle and freedom to innovate and so forth. So it's not, I, I don't think it's like, it depends on where you draw the line. And I think that it is possible to define exceptions narrowly, specifically because there currently are exceptions in most net neutrality regulation that is drawn narrowly to address corporate uh, interests that I, I wouldn't agree with. Uh, but I think that what we really do need are exceptions that address non-commercial um, activities online that uh, um, would encourage social innovation in a completely different way. And it kind of goes to the, uh, the, uh, the goes back to the fact that neutrality is in essence a um, um, antitrust regulation and um, non-commercial activities generally are not 
normally regulated under, under such and such conditions. And so the fact that uh, the internet is somehow different uh, is, is, is a strange concept in that sense. So uh, I can do other closing remarks, but I just wanted to comment a little bit on that because I actually think there, there is a better rhetoric for Wikimedia in this section. <laughs> so uh, I did some work in the past for Wikimedia helping to develop the Brazilian chapter or the Brazilian community, whatever. And one of the things I saw right there, and one of my other hats is like I'm advocate for open educational resources, etc. Right. So one of the things that Wikimedia did well in some countries that internet's not there yet, or at least it's just there by the phone, is actually to do some of these deals to arrive on the phone and to be uh, included, for example, in one laptop or child, etc., etc. So I agree, Josh, actually with you. I don't agree. With you. I agree with you. But I also see that some of the deals are important to take a piece of the internet and a piece of a material that can be seen as educational resource to some regions where that's not possible otherwise. So I, I think there is another rhetoric that we should be uh, uh, thinking on, on in terms of these agreements. But anyway, in terms of, of my last message, I just want to be sure that uh, the, the net neutrality dynamic coalition did uh, a, a, a wonderful job putting a lot of things online, but I think now we are in a moment to go a step further and understand uh, what are the exceptions and how should be, should those be implemented in a moment that, as I mentioned, a lot of countries have or laws or resolutions, and in some cases those resolutions come from the telco uh, regulator. So one of the things uh, that would be interesting, and I'm saying that because I call upon folks in the audience to join this effort. Uh, a lot of other efforts <coughs> did some principles like the necessary proportionate and some other things like that. So is it time for us to, to, to build a set of principles that go more into detail on what it, what should be done or not in terms of regulating net neutrality? I'm not sure, right? We have risks as a little point, but if we are practical about the fact there are already legislations and resolution, resolutions. How can we contribute to that? I would just ask you to be extremely brief because uh, we are yes. running out of time. 20 seconds. I, I just want to, I totally agree with uh, Josh I, uh, on, on the points that he made. I will not repeat them. And uh, uh, regarding what Carolina said, I think that the many task here is to uh, collaborate in a fine way to implement a good net neutrality frame. It can be by law, it can be by regulation, it can be just a guideline for the telcos in the countries where a legislative step is impossible to take. Um, just that. No, it's really quick. It's like, um, uh, the, nobody talk about the Comcast and Netflix uh, agreement, but it's really simple. Some people say that there's no regulation on the internet or the internet is unregulated, and that's not true. Uh, Deals like this tends to check the internet, tends to create rules in the internet and laws in the internet. So now the private sector is regulating the internet without the intervention of the state. So that's why urgency to be aware and take care of that uh, from a public interest and human rights perspective. I have some closing remarks. I already did. Excellent, perfect. So uh, I would like to thank the participants to the public, everyone. Uh, the, the efforts of the Dynamic Coalition are ongoing. We, I mean, it was established eight months ago, so we yes. still have a lot of things to do. If you want papers, everything, go on uh, National Private Info, and uh, thanks a lot to everyone. Oh, sorry, we have a closing I think he doesn't. So, thanks a lot to everyone. <laughs>